we're talking about the pseudo inverse. Pseudo meaning false, false inverse. So it turns out that in very, uh, in terms of the, ma the, the possibilities of the types of matrices there are, there are um, um, just a few, few of, the, of the many different types of matrices that are of which you can compute a true inverse. Most matrices are tall and thin or short and fat. They're not, they're not even square. And so you can't compute an inverse for them. But you can always compute the pseudo inverse for any matrix. The pseudo inverse or the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse is written this way, A superscript plus. It's a matrix, okay? For a given matrix A, the pseudo inverse A, A plus, A pseudo inverse, is a matrix that satisfies four defining properties. These four properties define that matrix. So we've seen this kind of thing before. We saw ABA is equal to A. Now we have this one. This would be like BAB is equal to B. Okay. We saw that A that BA must be self-adjoint. And in this case, AB must be self-adjoint. Okay. So these two conditions actually are conditions on the matrix A being a generalized inverse. This one is that the A pseudo inverse is a generalized inverse of A. This one says that A is a generalized inverse of A pseudo inverse. So there's some symmetry there. It turns out that any matrix that satisfies these four properties for A is a pseudo inverse. And it turns out there's only one. For any matrix, there's only one pseudo inverse. It's unique. Okay, so that's actually a, a bonus, is that it's unique. This, so the, the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse is what we're talking about. So this is the defining these are the defining properties. Now, how does that relate to the solution map? Well, it turns out the pseudo inverse is a special case of the solution map. And it's a special case for both problems, for both the overdetermined problem and the underdetermined problem. Okay, so we saw that the uh, for the uh, overdetermined problem, we had this uh, equation that was associated with the normal equation. And I can go through and show that this single equation is equivalent to two, these two conditions. Okay, notice that these two conditions are only two of the defining properties of the pseudo inverse. The pseudo inverse satisfies these two properties and then some. So we have that. In the underdetermined case, there is at least one x that satisfies this equation. And so we, we again recast the problem into this form. That is, of all the solutions, we find the one with the smallest x. That led us to this solution map equation. Okay, And I can go through and show that this equation is equivalent to these two equations. Notice I get a is equal to aba again. That's one of the equations. This one is very similar to the other one. The other, in the other case, it was AB was self-adjoint. This one is BA is self-adjoint. So again, we have two conditions. Again, only two conditions for the pseudo-inverse. And so the pseudo-inverse, again, satisfies both of these properties and then some. So again, the pseudo-inverse is a special case of both solution maps. So what about the solution map and the projector? So the projector onto the range of A adjoint we saw was needed for the for the underdetermined problem. So here, E is equal to B times A. And recall from the previous that we had the E as B A. A is equal to A B A. So B A times B A, that's E squared. So E is equal to E squared. So E again is equal to B A B A, Baba. Um, but B A is self-adjoint. And so E is this quantity which is self-adjoint. So we saw the we saw the projector for the overdetermined case. This is the projector for the underdetermined case. In the general case, for any A, again, we can always factor it. We can always find an F and a G so that A is equal to F times G, where F adjoint F determinant is non-zero. That is its full column rank and G, G adjoint determinant is not zero. It is full row rank. So notice that the adjoints appear in different places here because this one, F in general, will be tall and thin. G will be short and fat. So this is always multiplying 
the short and fat version by the tall and thin version. Okay, so this is the short and fat version of this. This is the short and fat version, and this is the tall and thin version. So we're, basically, we're getting the compact square of that matrix. So B then is the pseudo inverse of A in general. We can always pick B to be the pseudo inverse of A. Pseudo inverse of A is the pseudo inverse of G times the pseudo inverse of F. The pseudo inverse of G is this expression. Pseudo inverse of F is that expression. And so in general, for the overdetermined case, we can go through and show that the projector, which is AB, is given by this expression. Notice it only deter is determined by, uh, by F. Remember that AB, that A, which can be multiplied, written out this way, that F, the range of F is actually the range of A. So because of the fact that F has all the linearly independent, uh, spans the same, uh, same space, I can show that the range of A is equal to the range of F. And here then, in the overdetermined case, again, we have F coming out in front here, and I can show that the range of E is the range of F, which is the range of A. Okay, and so we have this. So notice that in the overdetermined case, the projector is only a function of the F. In the underdetermined case, where we're concerned with the null space of the matrix, that is E is equal to B A, we get this matrix. It's only a function of G. In the exactly determined case, that is, when A is square and itself non-singular, we can, we can show that the projector is the identity matrix and B is the inverse. It's just the, the inverse of the matrix. So this is like the, the special case. Usually you're going to have one of these two cases involved. Finally, for the underdetermined case, for any A, we can always find F and G this way. Again, we have the project our B, our solution map. We have our projector, which is only a function of G. So notice that we, in general, will want the projector onto the null space of A. So the null space of A has this projector. Instead of having E as its projector, the null space is actually I minus E. Okay, so H here is I minus E, and I can go through and show that A times H is equal to zero. A times H is equal to, so this matrix times A is non-singular. I'm sorry, is zero. H is in, totally in the null space. So to find the orthogonal complement of A, we would basically form H find the independent columns of H, these become the columns of A perp. So we saw A perp and how that came out when we looked at the, uh, the parameterization of all solutions of the linear equation. And so this is how we would find A perp. So we not only need B, which is the solution map, A pseudo inverse, but we also need A perp, which is in the null space of A. And this is how we would go through and find that. So you'll see an example of this in the solved sample problems.